Welcome everyone to our May PL Andres All Hands meeting. Jenna, the same as usual, we have our working group update. We have a couple of spotlights and then a deep dive into Caboose. Learn more about Caboose in this meeting. Reminder, what is the PL Andres Working Group? We are one of many engineering and research working groups across the Protocol Labs network, um, where we are pushing forward technology to make the world better. Um, this is really harnessing the fact that we think the internet and computing is one of the amazing upgrades that humanity has had in the past couple of decades. And many of tomorrow's breakthroughs and exciting new capabilities are going to be built on top of the technology and foundations we are building today. And we want them to be resilient, efficient, and empowering of human agency. Um, so we work on all sorts of amazing protocols um, within Web3 um, uh, and beyond, uh, honestly, but uh, a lot of our work goes into IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, but a number of other protocols as well, um, such as distributed randomness beacons, um, data layouts for Web3, testing frameworks, um, retrieval solutions, and much, much more. Our mission is to scale and unlock new breakthroughs for IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P, and related protocols. We do it in three main ways driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, so engineering, research directly, scaling the way that we do our network native research and development so that we can bring a larger community along with us and empower many other groups to join us in all of these uh, you know, deep open source improvement uh, projects and uh, also in stewarding and growing uh, OSS projects, communities, and networks. Reminder, these are some of the different uh, teams within the PL Andres Working Group um, contributing towards a number of the projects we work on. And this is our strategy for 2023. And I, since we're, you know, now uh, in, in our, well, we're not quite halfway through the year, but we're maybe halfway from last time we really spent a lot of time diving through um, why are we focused on some of these things. I wanted to, to go over it a little bit more in depth. Um, but high level reminder, we spend a good chunk of our time working on critical system stewardship and growth. These things do not stay functional um, automatically. Uh, software needs uh, repairing, improvement, and scaling as more people adopt it. Um, and so we are constantly uh, working to help grow, release, and um, kind of scale these systems, growing the teams that are working across it, enabling many other groups to come into um, these networks and build um, new implementations, um, new uh, improvements, uh, and, and new projects uh, harnessing these protocols. Um, and then we have two uh, kind of like core foci for this year. Um, one is really focused on robust storage and retrieval. Um, making sure that that works really seamlessly across IPFS, Filecoin, LPP, et cetera, um, and scaling into uh, additional um, kind of like CDN solutions so that you can have very, very fast uh, retrieval uh, around the world for data stored in these systems. And then around compute over Filecoin state and data, um, empowering many builders to build on top of Filecoin with smart contracts, with um, layer twos or subnets as we're calling them, um, increasing the chain space available and the tooling available for um, people to run all sorts of exciting compute networks so that they're harnessing the data in Filecoin for more and more useful um, outcomes. And I just wanted to tie this back to what we talked about um, kind of in our kickoff uh, for the year in November at Lab Week. Um, we were talking about the Filecoin master plan and how this fits into the core three steps that we've been working on. And so um, the first step of that is building the world's largest decentralized storage network. Step two is onboarding and safeguarding humanity's data within that decentralized storage network. And step three is bringing compute to the data and enabling web scale applications to interact with and build on top of that. So we have spent you know, a chunk of time on building the world's largest decentralized storage network, and we have the world's largest decentralized storage network. Um, we uh, kind of achieved a pretty exciting amount of this growth in year one, um, and we also uh, achieved having a, uh, the cheapest large-scale storage network in the world, um, a fastest uh, upgrading blockchain storage network, um, and we made a lot of uh, improvements to uh, storing data in Falcoin, making it a lot a lot easier than where we were at a, a day one when Filecoin uh, hit mainnet. Um, and so just within the last 12 months, um, network power has increased by 25%, and you see um, significant growths both in North America and Asia. Um, but we also really wanna make sure that um, as we have this large scale storage network that we're resilient to all sorts of macro and crypto cyclicality. And so that's an important component of making sure we continue to hit that top line goal um, is making sure that as um, 
you know, our, our macro environment is in a different place than where it was a year ago at this time. Um, but even then, Juan has an awesome talk uh, about how to be prepared for crypto winter for various different participants in the Filecoin ecosystem um, from about a year ago. I think it was May 2022. Um, that is a, a very good rewatch point. Um, but we absolutely see this sort of cyclicality in um, other Web3 uh, ecosystems and other kind of like proof of work um, environments. And so making sure that Filecoin um, stays resilient to that. We are way more more uh, resilient and sticky as a uh, uh, an ecosystem than um, other things like Bitcoin that see these huge drops in things like hash rate on top of um, macroeconomic changes. Um, but making sure that the data that's stored here is also resilient to those sorts of changes is really important. And there's a lot of groups um, across the Falcon ecosystem and more, more here needed um, that offer those sorts of resiliency programs for um, Filecoin storage so that clients don't have to worry about um, that sort of cyclicality and they can store their data and walk away. And so there's um, Evergreen solved that for slingshot data. Um, Lighthouse is offering a, uh, you know, auto uh, uh, repair and renewal and permanent service on top of Filecoin. Um, the NFT forever smart contracts, we're doing the same for uh, data that was stored by NFT.storage um, from a transferring or um, getting investment from others or uh, kind of like leasing out your storage provider to other um, investors or clients. Um, Phil Peggy was a smart contract that did that on top of FBM and there's a number of others. And so um, that's a uh, an important part of continuing to make sure that we hit um, uh, master plan step number one. Um, step number two, onboarding and safeguarding humanity's data. Um, this has seen amazing growth, 10x growth um, in the past year, which is awesome. We're almost at 900 petabytes of live data across 30 million active deals. And that's really, you know, thanks to the software getting better, um, more clients and storage providers getting involved in data storage, the economics, making sure that they push people to store actually useful data instead of just doing proof of work mining on empty sectors and never actually putting this to work to store humanity's valuable data. Um, and, and a lot of work also on making this a lot easier with tooling and onboarding ramps. And so, um, Big, big snaps to all of the folks um, from the estuary team working on Falcon web services, um, the uh, NFT storage, Web3 storage teams making this easier, and the Falcon Plus team who's both working to scale this and uh, significant programs working on quality and making sure that the data that gets Falcon Plus multipliers is real, valuable, useful data um, and not you know fraudulent data or anything like that. Um, and we've seen really amazing examples of large scale clients coming on top of the Falcon network. There's CERN's Atlas project. There's, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, documented war crimes uh, from Ukraine, from the Starling Lab, which has been submitted uh, to UN court to be uh, referenced and, uh, you know, utilize Filecoin's verifiable proofs there. Um, there's dark matter research from UC Berkeley, uh, Holocaust testimonies, many, many more. These are just some of the examples that uh, the team's actively working on supporting Internet Archive, many other groups who are all uh, becoming the groups that are onboarding and safeguarding humanities data. Um, and final step, bringing compute to the data and enabling our web scale apps. And that's, we're in the thick of that right now. Um, we have FVM. FVM launched just a month and a half ago now. Super exciting. Um, you know, a very big step forward for this ecosystem, um, but also still requires a, a lot of, you know, onboarding work energy to make this usable and accessible and to help many groups build on top of this new ecosystem and capability within Filecoin. And so it, it a lot of, uh, you know, our work helping make this exist um, uh, has come to fruition, but now there's a lot of work from this entire ecosystem to harness this and make it um, accessible and useful to others. Um, there is, you know, the COD Summit has been happening this the past uh, two days, but uh, work to bring large scale compute over Filecoin data. There are going to be many of these different compute networks in Filecoin, optimizing for different um, trade-offs from privacy to verifiability to performance. And that's awesome. And we, there are already multiple that are in flight. I believe there are some like Phil Swan that are live um, and more of these are coming. And so this is a very exciting future for Filecoin. Um, you know, uh, a chunk of this is already unblocked. We already have Water Lily, which is doing, utilizing the, the Buckle Yao network to um, run uh, AI compute jobs to generate uh, stable diffusion images for NFTs. Um, but we expect there are going to be many more um, utilizing the building blocks of Bakliao, but also taking them further to, to become 
uh, Web3 networks. Um, and a, a very valuable and important component that they would like to build on top of is things like IPC, which enables you to um, kind of run your own subnet, run your own compute network, or L2 um, kind of like smooth, smoothly and seamlessly within the Falcon ecosystem so that um, you can create you know, compute incentives for large scale um, network uh, creation. And so a lot of the work that we are uh, doing right now is building towards um, these building blocks existing. Um, and so I uh, wanted to, to kind of like snapshot what is our progress on some of these different tracks of work. Um, we've made a ton of progress on compute over data. Bakaliao just hit 1.0 day before yesterday, I think, and announced at the COD Summit. Um, but there's some additional building blocks we need here such that we can have large scale compute networks operating on top of FVM, utilizing interplanetary consensus and building their own Web3 compute networks. But that we are making great progress through the set of dependencies to uh, kind of like unlock all of those many compute networks to exist on top of Filecoin. On the retrievability side, um, we have many, I think it's 2,000, 3,000 Saturn L1 nodes that uh, exist and are offering retrieval requests. We now have Lassie, which is a lightweight retrieval client that we did a deep dive on last time. And we are working on opening up Saturn for client usage. And this is a big, important, challenging chunk of work, um, but we're making really amazing progress here. The Saturn team, Bedrock team, uh, IP stewards team um, are all contributing to this effort. Um, Daghouse team is also now getting involved as client number two. Um, and so we have a chunk of work going here and really productionizing fast um, web, two, web two speed retrievals of data stored in Filecoin. Um, also thinking a lot about you know how, what is the incremental way in which we um, build the retrieval capability build retrievability metrics, build retrievability incentives um, so that we can make sure that we scale this um, smoothly across our network. Um, storage and capacity. Um, I don't believe sealing the service is quite live and available yet, but Supranational and a number of other um, SPs that are working to offer um, sealing as a service um, to other to others as like a, an offering within the Falcon network are working hard on this and I think are approaching open availability imminently. Um, and so that's a very exciting option, which really reduces the uh, the cost per ceiling uh, a ter terabyte of um, storage into Filecoin significantly. There's also a chunk of work happening across um, Bedrock and PhilDev on making it much easier to operate a storage provider such that there um, are much less operational overheads and that the human effort that goes into um, storage providing uh, you know, requires less, uh, hey, why did it go wrong? And more, oh, good, I, it's continuing to operate as expected. Great, I can go back to work and do other things. Um, and then finally, really want to touch on, um, you know, a ton of our time goes towards the critical system growth and stewardship. And amazing work has been done by many folks um, to release, upgrade, and make new capabilities available. We see many new um, IPFS implementations uh, being able to thrive and differentiate have new transport capabilities, um, thanks to all of the work across libp2p and IPFS in terms of um, kind of like making those uh, browser capabilities or transports available, um, or uh, pulling all of the, the the guts out of Kubo such that other people can build non-Kubo IPFS implementations utilizing some of those same libraries. Um, Helia is a you know new new JS implementation on the block able to replace JS IPFS. And then a massive amount of work has happened across the entire PhilDev team and, and many others um, involved in Falcon network releases. Um, some of these, you know, solving critical, imminent, high impact, uh, you know, performance or security issues. Uh, and others of these helping bring things like FEM uh, to the table. So like we put a ton of our time and energy into into that thread and we really need to celebrate that as well because like people are making sure that that uh, all of the the progress that we've made so far doesn't regress, um, which is really big. Um, and if you want to track these things in real time, you can track them in star maps, but it's maybe a little hard to see all of the pretty logos of the amazing things people are working on there. Um, but feel free to, to comment there and track ongoing progress. Anyways, I just wanted to walk us a little back through kind of like how our strategy ties into the Falcon master plan, the progress we really are making against it, um, and, and celebrate some of the awesome successes we've seen so far this year. And with that, I will hand it off to, um, some of the other Andres leads to talk about our progress on our Q1. You two OKRs. Thanks, Molly. I'll start with the keep critical systems running, growing, releasing, scaling, and secure. Um, on the IPNI reader privacy project, all of the 
lookups in SID contact now are double hashed and can be read from the private store. Um, but we're ramping up those reads slowly. It was 30% at the beginning of the week. I think we're actually much higher now, but that will in the next couple of weeks be um, 100% reads from the double hash store. On the DHT side, there's been kind of a regrouping there and unlikely to meet um, the goal for this quarter, though the team is going to kind of reevaluate timing and the plan and probably start out with a plan for a composable DHT that then reader privacy be built upon. On the um, three critical Filecoin network releases, we already um, had two in NV19, um, and so no further update right this week. Um, Steve, go ahead. Great, thanks. Yeah, so for hyperscaling and accelerating the talent and teams contributing to the PL stack, uh, you know, some some great things have happened. Three, three of four network events have been successfully executed. You know, the fourth and consensus day is uh, is coming here in June. Uh, you know, don't have this marked as green yet in terms of fully hitting uh, the target numbers in terms of attendees and views. But again, still still great events, and we'll see where this pans out at the at the end of the quarter. But um, yeah, so that's what's happening on the events side. Uh, regarding other IPFS implementations, potentially using um, Box, slowly, like this effort has definitely slowed a, a bit in terms of we haven't been making a lot of uh, proactive, uh, you know, evangelizing effort. I'm um, definitely making sure we're at least being reactive uh, um, to, to folks. There's a couple of targeted things that'll be happening here with a with a blog post and meeting with some users that had ex we've already set up some meetings with users that had expressed a lot of interest in IPFS thing. But uh, you know, this isn't a slam dunk yet, so going to keep ch chipping away at this one. But that's where we're at here. Back to you, Lauren. Thanks. On the scale data onboarding and CDN speed retrievals to drive super linear adoption with Lighthouse users, it's quite a mouthful. Um, on Saturn, we have kind of two plus customers at this point. We have um, implementation in effect for Rhea, that's customer one, Devi design phase for Daghouse customer two, and there's a third customer in the works um, that's going to be working on a trial for serving NFTs through Saturn, which is exciting. Um, the P95 time to first bite went from 14 seconds to four seconds um, since last time we checked in, which is awesome. On the success rate, we went from last time at 43%, we went down to 36%, but actual successful retrievals themselves went doubled from about 54 million to 101 million. Um, further work happening, particularly on like HTTP retrievals that will hopefully get the success rates and the numbers up in the next couple of weeks. And then on the cost savings for Daghouse, the the planning for moving over to Saturn is in the works. Jason? Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Um, on the our objective objective for upgrading Filecoin on the FAM end, we are having our team summit this week. The team is in Boston. Um, you will hear about uh, great updates later from Raul. Uh, in regards to our metrics, uh, we are really growing a lot our uh, Filecoin managed to FM contracts. We're at 80, 830,000 as of today. Um, in our 1,000 unique smart contracts targets, uh, we are almost there, 920 as of this morning, and we are at almost 80,000 uh, unique wallets through FEM. Uh, there is no further update on IPCN, but then one was launched, and uh, Bacala 1.0 was launched as well. You will hear about the weird update, updates uh, later during this call. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, great progress. We're about at the middle of the quarter. I know it, how it flies by. Um, it's so great to see us, you know, almost hitting or have hit a number of these goals and then uh, and getting really focused on um, where to spend our time for the rest of the quarter. Yeah, great. So, sounds good. Thank, thanks, Molly. So IPFS stack, just a quick reminder here, right? This is a suite of specifications and tools where the data is addressed by its contents, it has a verifiability mechanism, and it's moved in ways uh, that is tolerant of arbitrary transport uh, methods. So in terms of some of the metric KPIs that we look at, on, on terms of community activity growth, just a reminder here, this is just looking at activity within the IPFS GitHub org. And when we say someone that's active, we're talking about folks that have made at least three of those actions in, in that month. So we're trying to filter out drive-bys and people that are actively uh, engaged. Not, not a lot going to say on those metrics right now. 
In terms of the network sizing and performance, you know, for, first a couple of call outs, this has switched over to use the infrastructure that the ProBlab team is actively maintaining. Uh, and we, we know where all the data is coming from and are you know, on top of that. Uh, but this is admittedly not telling the whole story by any means of the IPFS network. This is only, you know, the quote public IPFS DHT. Uh, there is a tracking issue on how this gets expanded to other, other networks. For example, like uh, nodes that are just engaging with network indexers, for example. Um, so please feel free to click in on that, look to see where the current thinking is or leave the thoughts. Um, and again, all of the specifics of where this data comes from and when we stop, stop, start and stop, stop watches, that's all linked from the graph details. Uh, but yeah, no other major changes need to talk about there. In terms of uh, IPFS you know, implementation highlights here, you know, the big thing was IPFS thing. Many people were involved in this this last month. Thank you to all involved in Andres and outside of it. A lot of you can see some of the stats there in the in the picture. But again, lot, lots lots happened. Great thing is all of the content was recorded. Um, the, I, I find the easiest way to quickly index and get into that is the recap blog post that was put on the IPFS blog. So that link is there. And also some Endres teams also did their own recaps of their takeaways and actions that they're taking. So that's that's linked. Uh, you know, Molly mentioned Helia earlier, but you know, Alex did a great uh, you know, presentation at IPFS thing, kind of you know, you announcing it and being clear about what the project is trying to achieve. Um, and there, you know, there's been a lot of focus on improving the documentation and usability of it. We saw some, some what I think of a magic in the way service workers are now resolving IPFS URLs in the browser and had a great success story at the event where dclimate was able to convert from JS IPFS to Helia over the course of the, the weekend of the event. On the Kubo side, you know, one thing to just call out is it has a new look. Um, so just plan on seeing this logo, logo show up more places. You know, this camper van uh, motif is really intended to capture the what Kubo is probably best suited for of helping the independent self-hoster. Um, and so, yeah, that'll, that'll pop up more, more places. Kubo itself had a 0 0.20 release, which has uh, a lot of improvements on the gateway side, particularly being driven by uh, RIA. It's also using the latest Boxo code underneath the covers where we did a a lot of repo consolidation. Uh, we did get a guide out for the community about how you would customize um, Kubo and different pros and cons of various options. A important thing for people to be aware of about the network is that the Hydras are fully, fully dead. They have uh, they have run their course. You know, we shut them to be, we reduced them to network bridging mode at the end of December. That bridge is now gone. The Hydras are gone. The EC2 instances have been deleted. I think there was even a request to delete the AWS account. Um, so that uh, that is there. You, there's a link to the dis, the IPFS discussion forum post giving more of the information on that. But that has occurred, and also kind of building off a talk that had been given at IPFS thing. A blog post went out about um, an event earlier this year where half the DHT nodes were unresponsive and how the network performed. That it was resilient in that, but also some of the actions that we've been taking. So uh, in terms of what's up ahead, we are we do have some additional follow-ups from that event that we're going to be fully handling this next month. And then in general, a lot of the engineers are focused on uh, further gateway improvements, largely being driven by what's needed for RIA around partial car support on trustless gateways. And so there will be landing that spec, getting implementation in Box Okubo, and the uh, corresponding conformance tests. And then on the Helia front, now we're going to be active on the deprecation of JS IPFS and you know, get, getting a working group together um, for doing more of this uh, user-focused uh, Helio work. So stay tuned for that in IPJS, but please raise your hand and, and jump into that channel if you're uh, of interest. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Over to Ignite. Cool. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, so uh, we've done a number of things, but I'll talk about just a few of them. You can read the slide for most of it. Um, a lot of work has gone into IPFS Companion MV3, which is a, a big architectural change required by, by browsers, mostly Chrome, uh, for our most popular product. And because Companion is our most popular product, as you can see there in the, in the metrics, um, we want to get feedback from dog fooders before rolling MV3 out more broadly. So uh, we'll be releasing the beta channel. Um, it's in review right now, so please help us out. A star map it will be migrating as well to D3 rendering very soon. And the old or current functionality will remain available for now at legacy.starmap.site. We've got an issue open with uh, Infra to uh, make that domain name available, and then that will that will be available. If you haven't tried the D3 rendering on star map, uh, please do and leave some comments on that issue. It's linked in the slide, but it's issue number 237. And then, you know, speaking about JS IPFS deprecation, I saw a question. Um, it is not officially deprecated right now, um, but 
um, we are we will be working on it, providing a migration guide, things like that. Uh, the Ignite team will be helping out with that. And we're looking for project suggestions for tools or libraries that never quite took off with JS IPFS. We want to show wins for Helia. So if you have examples or tools where you're like, oh, this didn't quite work right, like, please let us know. We want to show those wins with Helia. And then our metrics were added to all projects in the beginning of the year, and we're starting to see trends. Um, that's why we only have like three months there. Um, but our first is companion at an average of 72,000 monthly users and followed by desktop at an average of uh, 16,000. And I want to call out that desktop does consume web UI. So web UI is actually with all the, uh, you know, Kubo desktop and web UI, the website is at about 22,000, uh, users as of April. That's it. Peter. Hello, IPDX Interplanter Developer Experience team here. So we aim to improve the day-to-day -day for IP stewards and friends. Uh, last month, we've been to IPFS Think, and yeah, we really loved it there. And we did two talks, uh, me personally, actually. So uh, if you haven't been there or haven't seen them, uh, I highly recommend seeing uh, how we handle automation in Kubaland and how we test uh, HTTP gateways. Uh, we also deployed our custom self-hosted GitHub Actions Runners to new repos. Goldie P2P, uh, Quigo, and Rustly P2P uh, are the three new ones, uh, and it went uh, even better than expected. We've already processed over 18,000 jobs for these new repos, uh, and that's 18 times more than we were doing for Kubo alone. Uh, and we also saw a reduction in mean workflow runtime for all of those repos by 30, 40, and 75% respectively. Uh, and the speed up mostly comes uh, from, from the fact that on self-hosted, we are not hitting hard limits on number of concurrent jobs that we can run anymore. Uh, we didn't neglect gateway conformance either. Uh, we implement new car check API. Uh, we worked on that with Eric from Saturn team. Uh, and we also implemented DNS link support. And both of these uh, make us much better suited to cover testing needs for uh, all the projects currently iterating in the, in the gateway space. Uh, we also, uh, actually, thanks to IPFS Pink, got to meet with, with Matt from the FVM team. Uh, and we got to, together during the event and followed up after and worked on making sure that Docker images from local nets that, that he developed are available in the Filecoin's GitHub container registry. Uh, okay, so what's next for us? Uh, we'll continue working on gateway conformance, that's for sure. Uh, in particular, we'll be focusing on test migration from Kubo and support for the centralized gateway working group. Uh, we're also getting uh, talk submissions ready for GitHub Universe, and I'm really excited about this one. Uh, we're also working with the P2P team on automating performance testing, uh, and we've on, on enabling new GitHub features for everyone, uh, such as, for example, secret scanning, cold scanning, or uh, private vulnerability reporting. And if you want to follow along and see what we're up to, uh, make sure to join APDX channel on Filecoin Slack. Thank you. Hey, look, oh, it's my fun. first all hands presentation. Hi, mom. So yeah, live P2P. So as a quick recap, it's a modular network stack for P2P protocols. Uh, I like to think of it as reports from the local plumbers union. Um, the only thing that's really an update here is that uh, as of IPFS thing, we now have seven plus implementations with the new Zig libp2p implementation. And uh, as usual, we're striving to try to improve um, the network ability and, and support for all the Web3 projects that use libp2p. Yeah, quick, some call outs here. So you look at the network size snapshots. Unfortunately for April, we lost um, analytics for the ETH beacon chain due to the source uh, going offline, but we were able to reestablish it uh, for this past month and the numbers went up. So that's all good news. Um, we're looking at trying to add in more numbers from other networks as well so that we can get a better, broader view of our impact um, internet wide. Uh, the other thing here about the, the GitHub activity, you can see we had a dip there in April. We were scratching our heads about this, we suspected it was IPFS thing, 
And sure enough, if you look back in the history there, uh, July 2027 or 2022, that was also an IPFS uh, thing month. So hopefully the numbers will be back up next month. We'll report out then and we'll talk about it then. Okay. I want to echo Steve's uh, sentiment about IPFS thing. I want to thank uh, everybody who showed up and contributed in the libp2p specific stuff. We had five uh, talks linked here. We had one workshop, which was really cool. Um, in a span of an hour, people were able to build a fully featured chat app over libp2p in Rust. And like I said, we've added the Zig libp2p um, implementation to the interoperability tests, and we're hoping to get uh, the JVM and .NET one in online as well. Um, let's see here, driving forward on our user outreach, um, we're taking a much stronger look at what organizations have a vested interest in the viability of libp2p so that we can have an, uh, a stronger drive towards long-term governance. I think it's important for us to start encouraging other organizations to have a sense of ownership and uh, control over the direction along with protocol apps. Um, in terms of browser connectivity, this is one of our top line goals heading into IPFS thing. I highly encourage everybody to watch this video from Max. Um, a ton of people worked on this. I want to thank everybody. I can't list them all here, but there was like 13 people who contributed to the, this demo and that talk. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, and this has become kind of our new unofficial motto that we connect everything everywhere all at once. Um, and then the IPFS thing recap blog post went out this morning. So if you want to see all the talks and, and commentary, it's all there. Let's see. Um, upcoming, we are well. We well. I'll, I'm sorry. But we'll go into the implementation stuff here. So we're preparing for some releases. Uh, the JS release just came out, uh, 45, um, with some simplifications that is making it easier for developers to utilize it uh, across projects, um, and some key uh, goals along our OKRs for doing cross protocol communication went into the Rust Loop P2P. And upcoming is this interesting discussion about what does libp2p plus http mean. Uh, there was a killer demonstration at IPFS thing where we showed intercepting http requests in a browser and sending them over uh, libp2p, but I think there might also be room for discussion about libp2p opportunistically offloading requests to http instead of over libp like a managed libp2p connection. So if you're interested in any of this, um, come join our conversations. Uh, it's it's actively being researched and decided upon right now. And then, of course, we're going to continue with all of our performance benchmarking. Again, there was another talk about this at IPFS thing, if you want to see where we're at. And I think that's it. So thank you for everybody who continues to support the P2P. Back to you, Molly. Awesome. Over to Jennifer for Falcon. Oh, Koi. <laughs> Sorry, I keep like laughing about like the oh, mission about Falcon. It's just like such a big statement, but we're actually doing it. It's like Falcon is targeted to be a decentralized uh, robust storage uh, network that's distributed for humanity's the most uh, important information. Next slide. Uh, on that node, uh, as a storage uh, network, uh, we a storage capacity is our uh, most important matrix. And as you all can see that the network still have a 12.3 exabytes of like storage forward within the network today. Again, the growth of the network raw by, uh, for those who don't know, RBP stands for raw by power. Uh, uh, it's uh, not growing as fast as we do in uh, two years ago. However, the QAP, which measures how much useful data is actually stored on the Falcon network today, is steadily growing. And we are hit hitting like 20.3 um, exabytes of the, uh, the QAP, uh, which means it over almost like 900 pips of data are stored on Filecoin today. As Molly mentioned in the chat earlier, if you're curious what kind of the data is stored on Filecoin, go to Filecoin heaven, explorer.com. You can see a list of the kind of, of the data there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another super exciting thing that we had was about two months ago now, we shipped FEVM and bring like user programmability to the network. And one thing we are tracking is how much uh, Filecoin 
uh, is actually managed by all the EVM actors, is a count of a placeholder actor, actors, because that's a measurement we, we can use to, to see the utility of the EVM. And as of today, over 1.28 million of Falcoy is uh, being managed like with, with hold by FVM like actors, which is like super, super exciting. A lot of them is uh is coming from the bridges, staking protocols that people have been building, or like even data dots in the uh, upcoming future. I think we all has more data for you later on. But also that means we have 900, 920 unique contracts ha has been deployed and over thousands of contracts has ever deployed on Cloudplay. So people are actually building applications on top of our storage network. Yay. Next slide. Uh, Falcoin highlights. I'm going to keep it short this time because it has been a, a exciting three weeks in the Falcoin land, which we shipped another yet another network upgrade, which we are used to. In the past six months, we literally shipped three network upgrades. However, the special thing about this one, it's actually the ever first Expedited like network upgrade we have ever shipped in the past two and a half years because Falcon network has been has been stable. However, in the past months we had been experiencing some like chain quality challenges. Uh, of the Filecoin network uh, that is causing storage provider to losing some of the block rewards they could have potentially earned, or like having no operators have sinking, uh, sinking challenges uh, uh, with the Filecoin network. So we were supposed to be shipping this upgrade in June. However, we were like, PPP, we have to ship it. And we did everything basically within a, a, within a week. Um, the key of this upgrade was the first FIP that introduced by the CryptoNet Lab team, especially A North and Kuba and Zen, uh, that we improved the, uh, the market crown by setting a market deal maintenance interval from one day to 30 days. That significantly improved our crown block validation time. As you can see on the right, that it goes from 20 to 44 seconds down to 1.35 seconds. I really want to explain why that was a dangerous situation for us to be A, because the Falcon block time is 30 seconds. When the crown time actually takes way longer, uh, that also makes like the, the, the whole block uh, creation and syncing is very dangerous for the whole Falcon network and causing all those problems. For example, the network win count, as you can see in the red box, was actually dropped by a lot from like six blocking average to two to three blocks uh, for a certain period of the time. And that means uh, the chain capacity is reduced against storage providers block rewards, uh, how much block rewards they got also is re reduced. But now we are already back to the uh, to the average uh, win count for the network. Uh, also, that's a huge deal for uh, our builders as well because of all these like chain syncing challenges, no service provider get a lot of API requests has facing a lot of challenges as well. As you can see here, the P99 latency on all the East method has dropped uh, dramatically uh, since the upgrade and that greatly, uh, greatly improved the builder experience. So next up, um, uh, there's a lot of things we can still do, but like instead of looking at the next big thing, we're taking a step down and just like slow down a little bit. And we want to better understand the Falcon states and also like having tooling built to better understand to better help us like monitoring the Falcon health so we don't have to ever do an emergency upgrade ever again and while keeping Falcon alive. So that is gonna be one of the effort that the field that is gonna spend some time on over the next couple of weeks or months. But at the same time, um, Proof and the Lotus Manor team have already started to implementing the synthetic pull wrap designed by the Crypto Net Lab team, uh, Luca, Irene, and Kuba in particular. It's a new pull wrap protocol that can potentially reduce the size of the temporary file saved between pre commit and commit process uh, from 40, uh, 400 gig uh, to 25 gig. Uh, Good. Uh, we uh, we expect that will be super useful for Celia as a service provider who have a large pipeline of like onboarding sectors. Uh, I think that's all from Falcon side. Awesome. Over to Daghouse. It's David from the Daghouse team. Uh, wanted to share that this quarter and probably next quarter too. Largely, our focus is going to be on capturing infra cost savings. So things. So we've been in growth mode for so long and 
Um, you know, that requires uh, scaling up infrastructure and just providing good service levels to our users. But um, at this point, taking a step back and seeing how can we rely more on, uh, you know, Filecoin copies of data, um, collaborate with Saturn, eliminate double spend, things like that. That's uh, where our heads are at mostly. Uh, we're also progressing our W3F project. Uh, we're looking to integrate that with NFT storage as the full launch for it. And there's some work to be done until we can start doing that. So hardening the infrared protocol implementations, um, getting that data into Filecoin deals via Spade, um, being able to um, have better visibility into user behavior, able to block users, things like that. Um, some quick highlights, uh, we did some tweaks to our HTTP gateway to reduce HTTP egress by 80% and um, bit swap egress out of Elastic IPFS by 50%, so some good cost savings there. Uh, we implemented Elastic Compatible Graph API in our gateways, um, and we are getting those records into IPNI now. Um, and this uh, could represent a big cost win because uh, once Reyes in production, uh, I. I we don't know the exact number yet, depending on Saturn behavior, but 85% um, of our BitSwap traffic going out of Elastic IPFS is to the web.link. So um, getting those reads into HTTP instead, which is much cheaper for us, uh, could be a big win. Um, also, just uh, some progress on, on the W3UP side as well. Implemented uh, the updated Ucanto spec in W3UP and um, created uh, the spec to start using a ucan based Filecoin pipeline uh, while interacting with Spade. Um, and yeah, uh, we're really excited about working with Saturn moving forward to to try and figure out how to utilize the network and all those great L1s to, to reduce our uh, infra costs. Hey everyone, this is Ronald from the FPM team speaking to you from Boston, where the team is having a retreat after we've been together. We're getting together for the first time uh, after seven months. And during that time, we actually shipped the FPM. So it's great to be uh, back together. Uh, so things that, uh, just a few updates on our roadmap, we have concluded the vertically scaling notice to reduce ETH, JSON RPC uh, latencies uh, thread. This is thanks to a number of optimizations that we that the FEM team landed together with the Lotus team in the last few weeks, uh, plus improvements, massive improvements coming from, from MB19, as Jenny, Jenny said earlier. Uh, so that that is concluded. We are also doing uh, moving ahead uh, very quickly with uh, upping up our game uh, in metrics. So cycle one of our metrics roadmap is already implemented and almost done with uh, with cycle two. Uh, so there's a great dashboard in Sentinel uh, in Grafana. If you want to take a look at it, it's uh, FebM analysis, and this is uh, basically where all our metrics are are being added. Uh, we're starting a new thread around. Uh, uh, building efficient historical access to change to change data in Lotus uh, devs and as well partners like the graph are being currently blocked by uh, high latencies when at, or impossibility of accessing things like all chain receipts, for example, or old state routes uh, to conduct indexing. So we're uh, we're really really focusing on that. We also started uh, road mapping exercises for M two point two, refreshing uh, the old roadmaps uh, around around shipping. Wasm actors, and we're really aiming for progressive delivery over various network upgrades here. Also starting a new road mapping exercise around data plus FPM that is going to be covering all the building blocks that devs need uh, to build uh, data solutions on top of FPM. So that is things like aggregation, proof of data segment inclusion, repair, replication, and so on. Uh, really focusing a lot as well on Explorer maturity, uh, working very closely with explorers to land complete feature sets and, and fix bugs and so on. Uh, one uh, public service announcement, high Hyperspace is being uh, deprecated, uh, so its end of life is scheduled by the end of May, and we're uh, progressing with moving uh, moving all developer activity to calibration net. So all services and um, and uh, things like bridges and DApps that have been deployed there are moving to calibration net. Uh, we'll also launch a new RFP to continue development of the Falcon Solidity library. So we've really upped our game as well in terms of uh, developer starter kits and tools. There is a new uh, set of Docker images to uh, to create, to basically uh, provide devs with a Falcon in a box experience that includes both local net and, and, and boost. Also cleaned up our starter kits and added two new starter kits. Uh, so there's one for compute over data and one for data DAOs. Uh, so those are great tools for devs to get started. Uh, 
uh, building on FEM. And there's also uh, an update to the Ledger app incoming that will unify the Ethereum and Filecoin wallets into a sing into the Filecoin app. So that's currently in review and Ledger is having, it's a little bit backlogged. So it would probably, it might take uh, a few more weeks, but uh, that is already uh, almost out. And then as to uh, KPS and highlights, as I said, the team summit is happening in Boston right now. Uh, we have 830K right now in smart contracts. And as Jenny mentioned, 1.28 million across uh, EVM metrics in general. There is a new metric that we're starting to track, which is total value managed. So what we're actually starting to see, this is very interesting, what we're starting to see is functional lending markets uh, really coming to life in, in FEM, which means that just tracking the contract balance of those uh, pools is not enough because fill comes in and then it goes out because it's, it's lent to, to storage providers so that they can deploy to the protocol and onboard data and storage. So really we're starting to see that, that come alive. So we're creating new metrics to actually capture the value harnessed uh, by, by FEBIM. And we think that that is somewhere around 1.5 mil and 1.6 mil uh, in, in, in fill. We have different readings. Uh, so we will uh, strengthen that metric uh, over the next weeks uh, until we have a, a, a final metric that we're confident about, you know, the, our metrics on, on unique smart contracts and transactions uh, per day as well. Um, and, and yeah, protocols are adding progressively, DeFi protocols are progressively adding their metrics to DeFi Yama, which is the golden standard for measuring, for measuring TVL. Um, and yeah, if you, uh, the Dataverse hackathon is now uh, started uh, at, the, at the top of, of this month and has 476 hackers uh, working on them, uh, working on the hackathon. And we've got, in terms of opportunities, the data plus FEM roadmap is going to be a key enabler in, in many, many new news cases on, on Podcoin. So yeah, focusing on that. And sorry for going over, <laughs> just realized. No worries, computer for data. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, in fact, I have so many announcements, I will keep it even shorter than that. Uh, uh, really, like the, the best thing to do is go check out our blog. Uh, Back of the Out did hit 1.0. There are so many people inside of PL to thank uh, from the top, from Juan and Molly to every team, FVM and, and uh, 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 Station. And uh, I'm blanking on all of them IPFS, Filecoin, Filecoin Plus, blah, blah, blah. They, everyone helped get us here. Uh, there, you can read tons of stuff on our blog about it. We also had the Computer for Data Summit, uh, 150 uh, people plus uh, attendees, uh, also in Boston, coincidentally, um, and so on. So I, I won't go into all the details. Um, uh, you know, the, the thing is scaling. We got mentioned in Forbes and SiliconANGLE for uh, the, the uh, work on, on Lilypad, um, uh, which is a combination of back AI plus FBM, executing on-chain, doing generative AI, tons of goodness. Uh, please check out our blog and stuff like that, and and I'll uh, keep it short so so the next people can go. Thank you, thank you, Giannis. Hello, everyone. Um, quick update since um, since February, I believe. Um, the problem team is very much on track according to our roadmap, which you can see uh, on Star Map. We have shipped Optimistic Provide, which is now uh, experimental in Kubo V uh, zero twenty. The nut hole punching study has been finalized, and we have a very nice shiny report out, which should which uh, you should go and check. Um, the CMI, which if you haven't heard, is uh, stands for Continuous Measurement Infrastructure, um, is now a thing and is mon monitoring several of our networks and protocols, and will be expanding to uh, to more, as uh, Steve also mentioned earlier. We're reporting results to problem.io, which is a new thing. You should just go and check it. Everything there is up to date. The whole thing is still in preview, uh, but we're shooting to have um, kind of V1 out by the end of June. So uh, now is the right time to give feedback if you want. Um, and uh, we've got lots of uh, measurement, uh, lots of ongoing work in terms of DHT optimizations. I won't go through them, but um, cool stuff is happening with refactoring, with double hashing and everything. Uh, a few things on the highlights. We've been at IPFS thing, of course. Uh, we handled and resolved a couple of incidents with the unresponsive nodes, with Hydra dial down, with DHT slowness. Um, exciting and um, very, uh, very cool stuff. 
Uh, we have deployed monitoring on all of PL's websites. And if you want to um, to monitor yours as well, just reach out to us. Uh, we're, we're having some cool uh, graphs coming out of that. Um, Guillaume from ProBlub took over uh, the stewardship of all things CAD DHD, LPTP CAD DHD. So uh, more improvements to come there. Um, yeah, and that's it. We submitted, our, our collaborators submitted two excellent papers in uh, nice um, academic uh, research venues so uh, more visibility to come from there thank you very much Still in front. Uh, hi everyone so we have um, uh, four focus points i guess uh, number one is enabling the ethereum api in our gateway nodes um, number two is our infrawide rollout of lotus 122.1 uh, so that was actually really, really important for us. So it's resulted in um, halving our snapshot size, and it's really, really improved the performance and reliability of the lightweight snapshot service. Uh, so just skipping onto KPI for a second, the raw snapshot size has dropped from 140 gigs to 85 gigs. Um, our snapshot success rate is back up to 97% over a seven-day interval. To give you perspective, a couple of weeks ago, it was somewhere around 50%, as you can see from um, the little caps in the top right of the slide. So it's pretty, uh, pretty sorry situation. <laughs> uh, we're very glad to have that uh, back online. Um, the third point is we've completed our split store rollout. So this is another major benefit for us because it's really, really reduced our operational overhead. One thing that we were contending with is frequent data store resets for Lotus workloads. Um, and uh, one benefit that I'm personally very happy about is uh, we're getting way fewer pages out of hours to fix that. Um, the data stores were affecting uh, SLAs for snapshots and, and causing all sorts of problems. So we're really, really happy to see the improvements around there. Um, and finally, um, thanks to um, thanks to the uh, recent event horizon change of Lotus, we can now deprecate the raw snapshots. So the minimum supported version of Lotus will support ingesting the compressed snapshots. And obviously the compressed snapshots are gonna be much smaller and much faster to transfer. So mostly it's been about around storage and we think that we can drive costs down for by at least 20% further to what we already have. Um, so that's gonna be our focus for the time being. Um, and you can find us of course on Phil Infra on Filecoin Slack. Thank you. Thanks Leigh. On to our spotlight, starting with Bifrost. Thanks, Molly. We'll keep it super brief. Uh, yeah, just wanted to quickly use this moment to share some uh, important work we did in Bifrost recently to update our metric stack so we can give you all those useful insights about all the IPFS IO gateway uh, operations. So the TLDR of that was basically we just outgrown our old stack and needed to uh, revitalize that a bit. So we took the opportunity to really look at that from the ground up and manage to get some wins in terms of uh, extensibility cost reductions too. You can see that it's like over 80 percentile because we managed to uh, leverage some spot instances and things like that. So it's like a huge win. Um, I'm conscious of time. So um, I guess the, the big TLDRs are just wanted to say thanks to Nikolai and the team for uh, leading the efforts there and all the hard work they did. And that it's the one implication of this is that we'll be sunsetting our old Elasticsearch and uh, Prometheus instances, but there'll be some upcoming announcements about that to publicize that and give everybody a chance. That's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Big picture. Go and check blog posts on the Computer Data Summit and watch the recordings because there's been a lot of great talks and a lot of great uh, tweets that you can go retweet from all of the people presenting about new computer data solutions and tooling to be used by computer data solutions. So congrats, folks. And on to Caboose. So Caboose is a thick client that we've written uh, over the last couple of months for Saturn as part of Project RIA. Um, and so this is this is going to be relatively quick, but I'll talk a little bit about where that fits in and, and the, the point, what we get out of, of doing this uh, and why we need a, a thick uh, client. Um, so, so let me first give a, a, a basic view of sort of like what's going on in Caboose. Caboose sort of has two big data structures. One is it has a pool of the nearby Saturn nodes that it wants to send requests to. Uh, and it keeps those sort of logically arranged in a stable hash. So based on what SID you're asking for, that hash is somewhere into something that looks sort of like a DHT um, and, and chooses one of the uh, nearby Saturn L1s to send the request to. Uh, and, and the reason that you use stable hashing there Right, is that it really improves your cache affinity 
that that a node is getting sort of a, a limited uh, space of SIDs that it is responsible for, uh, and as a result, uh, that that node then can can do better in having a warm cache for those. Uh, and then the other data structure that we keep is sort of a pool of other nodes that will sort of swamp in if one of these nodes starts being bad. So we've got sort of the fallback uh, set of Saturn L1s. Uh, and then what Caboose is doing is as it's getting requests, it's sending a, a small fraction of those to, it, it's mirroring them and sending a copy to sort of these other pending nodes to, to get a sense of, are they working right? Are they fast or should it swap one of those in because they're doing better than, than the current ones? So what, what are we doing here? We've got, you know, on a normal CDN, you'd use DNS uh, generally to talk to your CDN. Um, but DNS is centrally controlled, right? So someone has to run that DNS. That DNS has someone's name on it. And if we're really building a decentralized CDN, we ideally don't have you know, a single entity that can turn off DNS. Uh, and so if you imagine uh, that future in a year or something, we would have, we can, we can register the Saturn nodes through a smart contract and on-chain and in a decentralized way, but you've got to then have a client that finds who's registered and sends the request there. And so as long as you've got, you know, a thicker software stack, be that a JavaScript service worker uh, or a caboose in for Golang clients, they can actually go out and pull and find um, the, the set of active nodes near them uh, in, a, in a way that is decentralized and that, that is resilient. Um, the, the other, and, and so we, we want to provide sort of one layer of abstraction beyond just a direct list, uh, and that, that's what it does. DNS also uh, has a bunch of caching things that, that aren't what you're going to want if you're running something that's really a, you know, doing a lot of traffic and doing a lot of requests, right? If we're, if we're running things like uh, the, the IPFS.io gateway where we're sending hundreds and thousands of requests uh, per second, it's, it's sort of unacceptable to wait for the minute long DNS timeout before we fall over to another working uh, Saturn node. Uh, so we want to be able to be much more responsive uh, to node failures. Uh, and the way that we can do that is by having that active pool and active management in the in the client software to to quickly notice a, that a node isn't responding and start redirecting the request that would have gone to it somewhere else. Uh, and so custom software there can do better than just a standard HTTP client. Um, I, I guess the other one is that DNS doesn't always get you the fastest nodes, right? It, it gives you who the the DNS server uh, is thinking is probably in your region. Um, but based on doing sort of these active measurement uh, things, which is on each request, we're looking at how fast it comes back and using that to understand what our actual latency is to these Saturn nodes, we can have a, a much more realistic ranking of which nodes are performing well for us. Um, and then we also, by having the thick client, get to do a couple of additional things that are really useful for SAC. One is this mirroring to find other nodes. That, that, that's active software, right? That's, that's doing that. Um, but the other one that we can do is, is an amount of challenge and verification of Saturn itself. So we can send challenges uh, for SIDs that we know, uh, you know are unique, uh, and then we can make sure that we get them uh, and that they you know, don't show up also back in the logs of some other Saturn L1 or in the gateway. Uh, and so there's types of misbehavior that we can detect and then remove nodes from misbehaving uh, as a result of that. So uh, by, by having this client software, we get sort of the, the validation in both directions with logging for payments, with making sure that nodes are behaving correctly. And then also we can get better performance. Uh, so that's, that's the thick uh, client that is Caboose uh, for Saturn. Uh, thanks uh, hugely to Arsh and the, the rest of the Saturn team. And then also for everyone involved in Bifrost Gateway for the integration uh, and working with us on, on the design of Caboose. Uh, we uh, expect to launch it with RIA uh, relatively shortly. So uh, it'll become another part of the interplanetary stack. All right, I think that's what I've got. Awesome, thank you. See you all later. Bye, folks.